Hello, everyone, and welcome to our post-secondary education virtual library. Uh, my name is Brenda Dunn, and I'm the Military Family Services Community Coordinator based in Washington, D.C. Um, so this library was uh, initiated in an attempt to help our Canadian high school students and their parents as they prepare to apply to post-secondary institutions excuse me, institutions in Canada, so colleges and universities in Canada, and um, basically to deal with some of the specific problems and concerns of applying from the U.S. to Canadian institutions. So what we've done is we've invited a, a bunch of different universities and colleges from across the country to um, just give their speech like they would at a regular university fair, and also just to ask specific questions about what their university has that's specific that can help um, our students apply. So today our, um, our university representative is James Smith from Simon Fraser University in beautiful BC. Uh, he's the student recruiter or one of the student recruiters there, so welcome James. Thank you, Brenda. Yeah. So uh, my name is James Smith. I work in admissions and recruitment at SFU. Uh, and I believe the plan today is for me to give a presentation and then we'll have some Q&A at the end as well that will dive more deeply into uh, specific questions regarding um, studying in Canada for Canadians coming from abroad and specifically for military families coming from um, the United States. Um, so Simon Fraser University is located, as Brenda mentioned, in British Columbia. We have three campuses, but our main campus is in Burnaby, BC, which is just in the greater Vancouver area. We're about 15 kilometers east of downtown Vancouver. And SFU is actually the top-ranked comprehensive university in all of Canada. Um, and whenever you look at our sort of uh, undergraduate recruitment materials, our publications, you'll see this phrase all over our um, our materials is outside thinking. And that's kind of how we like to think about what we do at SFU. We have to think outside the box a little bit. And there's a few different ways that we do that. So one way is that we're a little bit unconventional in the types of programs that we offer. So if you look at any, again, at any of our materials you, or our program list, you'll see a chart that looks kind of like this one that shows all the different programs that we offer at SFU. We have eight different faculties and over 100 different programs. And of course, we offer all the stuff you might be used to from high school, like biology or history or psychology or that kind of thing. But we're always also working to identify new and emerging fields or interdisciplinary fields that will really make sure that our students are well prepared for the um, world once they graduate. And so that's why we offer programs like Interactive Arts and Technology, which is based out of our Surrey campus. Um, and this is actually a shot from one of those classes um, where we had students working on building immersive virtual reality environments based on real world environments. And so aside from interactive arts and technology, we have a brand new program at our Surrey campus as well called the Sustainable Energy Engineering Program. We have interdisciplinary programs like the Behavioral Neuroscience Program that's offered between psychology and biomedical physiology. So we're always trying to identify fields that aren't, that are trying to meet a need um, in the world that might not be offered at other universities. So to offer all these programs, we do have three different campuses. And so this is a map of the greater Vancouver area that shows those three campuses. Uh, the Burnaby campus, as I mentioned, is the main campus that's uh, home to most of our programs, most of our academic programs, as well as our residences, uh, all of our athletic facilities, the main libraries are all at the Burnaby campus. We have a campus in Surrey as well, which is just south of that. Um, the Surrey campus is mainly home to a handful of our high-tech programs, um, like the ones I mentioned earlier, Interactive Arts and Technology, Sustainable Energy Engineering, and Mechatronics Systems Engineering are all based out of the Surrey campus. And then the Vancouver campus um, is home primarily to our School for the Contemporary Arts. So that's things like film, music, theater, visual arts, that kind of thing. The nice thing about this chart is that it shows you how well connected those three campuses are. So those dotted lines you see are all the rapid transit lines in Vancouver. Um, it's really easy to get between the three campuses, and you can see in the bottom left as well, there's the Vancouver International Airport. So you can actually take the SkyTrain, which is our light rail from the Vancouver International Airport to downtown to the Burnaby campus to the Surrey campus. It only actually takes about 40 minutes or so to get between any of the two campuses on transit. And all of our undergraduate students have access to um, basically an unlimited transit pass called the U-Pass, so it's really easy to get around. 
So I'm just going to show you a couple photos of our campuses. This is our Burnaby campus. We're on top of Burnaby Mountain in Burnaby, about 15 miles, or sorry, 15 kilometers east of downtown Vancouver. That big building on the right is our main library. And the building where I work is just on the left there. This is our Surrey campus, um, as I mentioned, the home to some of our high-tech programs. They're actually building a brand new building for our sustainable energy engineering program at the Surrey campus as well, which we expect to be open in fall 2019. And then this is a part of our downtown campus. It is an urban campus, so we have a few different buildings around town. This is actually Harbor Center, which houses a few of our classroom buildings, and the Graduate School of Business is actually at the building in the foreground there at the Siegel Center. Oops, go back to slide here. So the other way um, that we sort of um, like to think outside the box or we try to make sure um, that our students are well prepared is by making sure that they're a little bit fearless. And the reason for that is because SFU is um, a research university. So what that means is that the professors that are teaching classes um, aren't just uh, teachers. They're also running labs on campus. They're constantly publishing their new findings based on their research. And they end up leaning a lot on our graduate and undergraduate students to help them out. So what that means is that undergraduate students have the opportunity to work with faculty as either research assistants or lab assistants, um, which can be a little bit intimidating at first, but it's a really good opportunity if a student ever wants to apply to graduate programs or go to law school or medical school. Having that real world research experience is a big uh, advantage. Another way that our students have to be a little bit fearless um, is if they're athletes. So we are a Canadian university, but we're the only non-American institution in the NCAA. Um, and I, I expect most of the people that will be watching this presentation are based in the U.S., so you probably know um, what the NCAA, NCAA is. That's the uh, National Collegiate Athletic Association. So our student athletes are going to be competing at basically the highest collegiate level in the world, but they'll also have access to the high sort of level of academic rigor of a Canadian post-secondary uh, education. So it's kind of a unique opportunity to outlay as well. We also try to make sure that our students um, aren't complacent. And what we mean by that is that we want to make sure that they're not just doing well in their classes. Of course, their classes are important. We want to make sure you do well in them. But we also try to make sure that our students are well prepared for life after school as well. So that's why we offer a lot of experiential learning opportunities. For example, cooperative education is one of those. So cooperative education or co-op is basically just a program where our students take a semester off of classes and then they go to work full time in a paid internship um, in the field that they're studying. So we do these co-op placements not only locally in Vancouver, but uh, across Canada and internationally as well. So we've had computing science students go down to not far, about uh, two hours south down to Seattle to work for Microsoft, for example. We've had engineering students working at BMW in Germany. Uh, I worked with a student in our office who actually did a co-op placement in accounting with PricewaterhouseCoopers, which is a big multinational business services firm, but she actually did her co-op placement at their Shanghai office. So there's a lot of different opportunities for making sure that you're well prepared uh, when you graduate to make sure that you're in a good position to find job placement, but you can also mix in some study abroad as part of that too because these co-op placements are global. And then finally, um, SFU is just a very inclusive environment. Uh, about 18% of the student body at SFU are international students. So those are students um, from outside of Canada. But then actually, we actually have a lot of students that are studying at SFU that are Canadians, but that actually weren't doing secondary education in Canada, like yourselves probably. So we have a lot of students that are coming from the United States and Hong Kong, for example, who are Canadian citizens, but bring sort of a global perspective when they're studying at SFU. We offer services for all these students. If you're, um, if you're an international student, we have advisors to help you with your study permits or that kind of thing. If you are um, having trouble picking your classes, we have academic advisors, we have co-op and career advisors, mental health and counseling services. So it's all kind of a one-stop shop in our student services at SFU. Aside from that, the students themselves actually uh, do a lot to um, help themselves. So we have over, 200 student clubs on campus. They're all funded by the Simon Fraser Student Society. We have very active student governments and student departmental associations, as well as rec sports. So that's if you're um, wanting to be active, but you don't want to be involved in varsity sports, we offer a lot of rec sports, like a rock climbing wall, soccer, tennis, and so on. So there's lots of different ways to sort of stay active and meet people outside of the classroom too. 
So that was kind of a general overview of the university, but I am going to talk a little bit about our admission requirements, and then later on when we do the Q&A, we can dive into a bit more detail if there's any specific questions about these. Um, the basic sort of steps to apply to the university are to, first of all, choose your program. So when you're applying to Simon Fraser University, you're going to be applying directly into one of our eight faculties. So you have to have a bit of an idea of what you want to study before you get started. Um, but depending on which program you apply to, there may be different admission requirements. So sometimes um, some programs might require some advanced mathematics, for example, if you want to go into engineering or business. They typically require that you have a class that's um, a pre-calculus or a calculus class. You'll check those, and we can talk about those a bit later as well in terms of uh, the American curriculum. Um, once you've checked that, make sure that you have those admission requirements or you email the recruiter like myself to make sure that um, to, if you need help seeing if you have the right courses, then you can go online to our website, just sfu.ca slash admission to complete your application and pay the application fee. So this first part is really just where you're telling us your name, telling us which program you'd like to apply to, giving us a bit of information about yourself, and then paying the application fee. And what that does for you is it creates a profile for you um, on our student information system or then we'll ask you for documents like your transcripts or your test scores, for example. Once you've done um, that first part of just playing the application fee and you have a student number, then you'll be able to also apply for scholarships and residence, which I'll talk about in a bit more detail. In terms of the admission requirements, the very general admission requirements for applying to SFU um, are that you complete a recognized high school curriculum. Um, I think the audience for this webinar is mostly going to be based out of the U.S. and studying at American high schools. So if you're completing um, an American high school curriculum, then that's perfect for us. Um, we do ask that you meet the English language requirement, which would basically mean that you have to do an English course in your senior, senior year. And we ask the students also meet the quantitative and analytical skills requirement, which also generally means that you complete a math course um, in your junior or senior year. Those are the general requirements for any program at the university, but as I mentioned earlier, depending on which program you're applying to, there might be additional course requirements. The funny thing about our course requirements um, for students like yourselves who are studying, who are Canadian but studying outside Canada, is that our requirements are sort of tailored to speak towards um, Canadian high school curricula. So what that means is if you see a course that says Math 12, for example, or Pre-Calculus 12, that might not mean a whole lot to you. So when we say something like pre-calculus 12, which is a common requirement for a lot of programs, usually what we mean by that is something in the American curriculum beyond Algebra 2. So your course might be called Algebra 3, for example. It might be called pre-calculus. It might be called calculus. That's what we mean when we say sort of an advanced math or senior level math. If you're not sure about whether your math courses meet the requirements for those programs, then again, I'll post my um, contact information at the end of the webinar here and you can feel free to get in touch with me or another recruiter at SFU. If you plan to stay in the U.S. for a bit longer after you finish high school or if you plan to go to a college in Canada, we do accept a lot of college transfer students at SFU too. So actually about a third of the students that come to SFU are coming from other colleges or universities. We recommend that you complete a year's worth of transfer credits, so it's about 24 credits um, if you're going based on SFU system. And if you do that, and you're studying um, college level academic courses, um, typically we're able to grant transfer credit for most of those if you're coming from an American college. Um, so it's a good way to, if you want to stay a bit closer to home or a bit closer to your family for the first year, or if you want to come study in Canada, um, but you didn't quite have the grades you needed to be directly admitted to a university, you can go to college for a year and it gives you kind of a blank slate because if you do that year's worth of college credit, then we will no longer evaluate you based on your high school grades but more based on the coursework that you've done at the post-secondary level. In terms of the costs, um, one of the great advantages of being a Canadian citizen is that if you are a Canadian citizen and you'd like to study at a Canadian university like SFU, um, you would pay domestic tuition rates. So that's where we have the cost here, where we have the Canadian and the international fees. The Canadian fees under the column CDN, those are for students who are Canadian citizens or permanent residents. We, in the United States, you might have heard about in-state and out-of-state fees, but we don't really have that same system here in Canada. Basically, if you're a Canadian citizen or a permanent resident, even if you've never stepped foot in Canada, um, if you came to a Canadian university, you pay domestic tuition rates. So it's a bargain. It's probably the best, uh, one of the best deals in town in terms of the quality to cost ratio for education. So it's a really great advantage for Canadian citizens around the world. 
These costs also include um, the typical cost to live in residence for two full semesters, as well as staying on the meal plan. Um, and the total cost at the bottom is the basic all-in cost in Canadian dollars. So it's still a good chunk of change, which is why we offer um, a generous scholarship program at SFU. Um, it's called the Undergraduate Scholars Entrance Scholarship Program. This does require um, an extra application for, um, to, to earn the scholarship, um, aside from the application for admission. Um, we ask that you have strong grades if you're applying for these scholarships. It says in the 90s range, again, that's sort of talking about the BC curriculum. If you're studying at an American high school on a 4.0 scale system, um, typically that means you want to have a GPA in the high threes. I would say at least around an A minus average is what we're looking for in terms of the grades. But if you have that, um, I encourage you to apply for the uh, entrance scholarships. On that application, we're going to ask for a bit more information about your extracurricular activities, we're going to ask for a personal statement and a couple of references as well. Um, but if you're granted one of these scholarships, they can range anywhere from $10,000 up to the cost of tuition for four years. It doesn't cost anything extra to do the scholarship application, so I encourage you to do it because it could potentially mean a lot of money coming your way. The deadline for this year, for example, for applicants for fall 2019 is quite early. It's on December 3rd, so it's coming up pretty soon from when we're doing this recording. In future years, it usually is um, quite a bit earlier than the application deadline, so keep that in mind as well. And finally, I just wanted to mention that we do have residences on our Burnaby campus. We have a small residence community, just under 2,000 students live on residence here. Um, residence is not guaranteed nor required for the first year, so if you'd like to live on residence, I recommend doing the application for that soon after you apply to the university. That way you get your name at the front of the queue for the residences. So if you get an offer of admission from us in the spring, um, we will hopefully be able to send you an offer for residence as well. The first year dormitories are single occupancy rooms. You don't have to share them with a roommate, which is nice. And then you can opt into um, living in a, either a study intensive floor or a single gender floor as well. And then I just encourage you to connect with us um, in other ways aside from just this webinar. So these are different ways of getting in touch with us on social media as well as our admission website. My email address is up on the screen there as well. Feel free to email me anytime if you have any questions about uh, the admission requirements to SFU or academics or student life or anything like that. Um, but that's about it for my sort of formal part of the presentation here. And I believe we're going to go to a Q&A with Brenda now. Awesome. <clears throat> Sorry. Thanks, James. Um, so great. You covered a lot of the things that I would have normally asked anyway, and thank you for kind of being more specific about um, students that are applying from the U.S. that are Canadian citizens. So yeah. um, a couple of quick questions with regards to um, your application process. I know that a lot of students here, um, they come from Canada kind of mid-high school range. So often they're changing from one curriculum to another, from one testing method to another, and sometimes their marks flip in the process. Um, and it's not really through any fault of theirs. They need to relearn how things are done. Is there any kind of way that they can kind of put this kind of information forward so that an, an admissions person could see that, you know, Yes, their marks are a little bit lower, but they were 90s when they were studying, you know, in Ontario or BC. And uh, is there any kind of supplementary type admissions uh, application form? Yeah. So for admission to most of the programs at university, it's a it's a pretty um, cut and dry sort of quantitative process where we're just looking at um, a students' grades for admission. There's a couple of programs where they do more of a um, what they call a supplemental application for those. So those specific programs are the BD School of Business as well as the Sustainable Energy Engineering programs. And having um, experience traveling and sort of experiencing different curricula and different cultures um, is actually something that would be valuable on those kind of applications. So I'd certainly encourage students to uh, speak to those experiences when they're doing the supplemental applications. For the other programs, um, as I mentioned, it's purely a quantitative process. So um, I recommend that students apply through sort of the, the normal process at first, but if they've had these really disruptive events in their lives that have um, kept them from doing well in school um, and their application is not successful because of that, because they didn't have, um, we didn't, um, they didn't meet the grade requirements on the first go, 
we do have a process for admission called diverse qualifications where we admit a small number of students who might have had extra hardships um, that might not be reflected on their academic record um, and we can consider them uh, for admission through that process as well. Okay, so and is that something that they would do through the like the advisors? The yeah, so apply? yeah, so what I would do is I would apply in normally um, and, and see what the results of, a, of the regular application process are. And if they're not successful um, at that point, then I would get in touch with a recruiter such as myself um, and let them know the circumstances and then go from there. Okay. And what about, um, so if they're applying, a lot of the high schools down here offer AP or IB credit, and I know yeah. you know, you mentioned that in the scholarships. Do you, um, and I'm kind of pre-asking because as we spoke about earlier, I, I do know some of the answers to this, but IB credit, um, what do you offer for that um, yeah. IB classes? So for students doing the IB curriculum, the International Baccalaureate curriculum, um, if the students are admitted to the university and they're doing the full IB diploma program, we grant those students 30 transfer credits. So basically a full year's worth of transfer credit. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that you'll always be able to jump right into second year classes, but what it does mean is that it'll probably knock out a lot of your, um, some of your, uh, maybe a handful of your introductory courses and then some of your elective requirements as well. So you may be able to graduate sooner, but then you'll certainly be able to save a bit of money because you wouldn't be paying tuition for mm -hmm. effectively one quarter of your, of your degree. Um, for students that are just doing, some schools offer the IB curriculum, but then have students that are doing sort of a normal American high school curriculum. If you're doing a few, uh, a few IB courses, but not the full diploma, um, then we treat those kind of like honors courses where we give them advanced weight in the evaluation process. So um, we kind of bump up the grades in those because we recognize they're a little bit more difficult. And if you do a higher level course, uh, so the IB, this is kind of the IB jargon, but if you mm -hmm. do an, an IB HL course or high level course and you get five or higher on your IB score for that course, we will grant transfer credit as well. Okay. Um, in terms of the AP courses, um, with AP courses, we bump up the grades on those as well since we do recognize that they're a bit more difficult. Um, and for students that do any AP exams, if you get a four or higher on the exam, then again, we'll grant transfer credit for that subject. Okay. Um, what, no, you did mention that there is no first year guarantee, but there is definitely a process to make sure that residence is available if you apply early or that sort of thing, you're yeah. not sure. But um, any other kind of uh, tips for someone, because of course all of these students, their families live out of the country, so residence is pretty important. Um, any other tips or just apply early? Yeah, uh, just apply early. Um, it's our application for um, the fall intake at any given year typically opens in October. So you can really do the first part of the application process um, in October, November, or the year before you're applying, October, November, December. And after you do that first part of the application, then you have a student number that you can use to apply for residence. And typically the students that are applying anywhere up to January or February for residence are applying early enough for residents that those students almost always get a spot. Um, it's usually the students that don't think about residents or don't think about putting in the residence application until April or May that might um, be in a bit more of a difficult position. But if you apply early for residents, you'll typically get a spot. Awesome. Um, and what about, so again, these students are applying from afar. Do you have any mm -hmm. virtual tours or live chats or any way that students can check out the campus from somewhere else? Unfortunately, we're, we're looking into doing those live tours, but we don't really have them. Um, we're not doing those yet. Um, we do have tours on campus if you're ever in town. We do those six days a week and you can book those online. But otherwise, we do information se sessions and webinars throughout the fall and spring. Um, kind of like this one basically where you can have more of a chance to uh, speak one-on-one -on -one with a recruiter and sometimes with a student um, and then those dates are posted on uh, our admission website. Okay and you have social media as well that, That's right. yeah. that posts these things as well for the yeah. students? Yeah. Um, Maybe I'll put that slide just back up here in the screen. Yeah that would be great. Okay yeah there's your Instagram and Snapchat, Snapchat. That's Snapchat yeah. Yeah. and Facebook. So, so and that's good too because parents as well as students can kind of check in on that um, 
often the students have a lot coming at them from uh, from different uh, U.S. colleges and uh, universities too. So it's nice to have some sort of virtual way of checking in. That's right. Um, one of the things on your slide that um, talked about the cost. Um, one of the, the pitfalls that I know that a lot of um, families have talked about is the international health care. Um, that is one of the costs. It's about a thousand dollars, I think, on your slide. Yeah. So, um, is there any way that um, I I know it's an opt out type thing, but right. Uh, usually what happens is because we have U.S. addresses, we're automatically put on the international um, uh, health care system, whereas we don't need it because we're all covered by uh, an out-of-country health care system. So any tips there? Just opt out as soon as possible so that yeah. you don't end up paying. What, there is a deadline for that, isn't there? Is that like the, September sometime frame? Yeah, so the um, there's two there's kind of two different things going on um, in terms of medical insurance. So the first part is is that if you're um, moving to British Columbia from out of province, then um, you have to establish residency in British Columbia to uh, be put on the medical services plan of BC, which is the uh, basic universal health care program here. So for those first three months, you'll be responsible for um, your own basic uh, health insurance. Um, we do offer a program through SFU called uh, GuardMe that is um, that's available. That's a thousand dollars we mentioned for that. But if you're covered by um, a similar or an equivalent plan, then you can um, opt out of that as well. It's just a matter of showing uh, proof of enrollment in another plan through, for example, your parents. Mm -hmm. um, the other part of health insurance is that um, so that's for the basic health insurance. But we also offer a extended health plan um, through the Simon Fraser Student Society for things like vision and dental and that kind of thing. And again, that's something that students are automatically enrolled in. Um, and so you will have to choose to opt out of that um, if you're covered by an equivalent plan. Um, and that will have to be done. Let me just double check our deadlines here because I don't know them off the top of my head. Um, the guard me the one time opt out. And for the secondary insurance or the extended health plan, you have to opt out um, on an annual basis. Okay. So if you're starting in um, the fall semester when most students are starting um, their studies, then you would opt out in the first two weeks of September. Okay. And that's one thing that our families, just if you're listening in, just make sure that you're aware of that. And I know that it's not just Simon Fraser that has a similar kind of um, health insurance um, that you have to opt out of. Yeah. Um, okay, I will have just, I think, only a couple more questions. SATs, ACTs, is that something that Simon Fraser looks at or they need to have before they apply? Yeah, so um, that's one thing to look out for. Um, basically, our evaluations are uh, have to be done based on whatever sort of curriculum a student is graduating from. So you may be thinking that because you're Canadian you don't have to, and you're applying to a Canadian school, you don't have to do the SAT or ACT. But if we do actually require test scores um, from anybody graduating from an American high school curriculum. So if you're graduating from an American high school, um, we need one or the other, SAT or ACT. Um, what we do there is we don't weigh those too heavily in the admission process, but we every year we have sort of a, a minimum uh, benchmark score that you have to meet. Um, so for the SATs for this year, for example, it was 1130 on the 1600 um, scale, and then for the ACT, we needed a score of 22 or higher. They're not exceptionally high scores um, for the test results. Typically, the grade requirements um, are a bit more competitive than the test requirements, and usually for admission to most of our programs, we're looking for, um, I would say, around a, on the American um, uh, curriculum, usually around a B plus, a B or B plus average or higher. Okay, and that's again one thing to be aware of if you're a family that's applying from out of the country that um, SATs may be required and you may not think that they would be, but they are. Um, and it's good to hear, I know a lot of our families are um, again coming from out of country so they've never seen an SAT before and all of a sudden they have to write one whereas a lot of students here have to write them year by year as a practice right. SAT. So. Um, so just keep that in mind uh, if you're applying from the U.S. 
Um, so really, I think that's just about it. Is there any other way that SFU helps um, military kids who are out of Canada or even military kids at all? Are there um, any other tips or tricks that you think that our families should know from out of country? Um, we don't have any specific programming for um, military families specifically, um, but we do have a, a dedicated team here of international advisors that are, or international recruiters that are here just to help students coming from outside of Canada. So that's really the tip is to get in touch with one of us, like me, for example, and then you sort of have an inside person that can guide you through the process or help you with any questions um, as they come up. So um, I'd encourage you not just to go to the website and um, submit uh, an application, but make yourself known a little bit to write an email um, and uh, to me, for example, or to one of my colleagues, um, if you just look up uh, the SF recruiters on our website um, and just let us know you're applying from out of country and um, I just ask us if there's um, anything that's missing in your application, let us know if you have any questions or concerns and we'll be happy to guide you through the process. Mm -hmm. And that goes for curriculum related items as well. Some yeah. curriculums don't ne curricula don't necessarily um, you know equate to what they've been taking in Canada when they moved down here. So that's right. And the thing too with um, um, American high schools is that um, the curriculum can be different from state to state and county to county and school to school even. So it's um, we don't have. Um, the language that we use on our website for admission requirements for American high school students might not be applicable to absolutely everyone. So that's why I encourage you to get in touch with one of us if you have any questions about whether you're taking the right courses to get into the program you want to study. Awesome. Well, thank you, James, very, very much for, um, for speaking with our families. As you know, we have about 700 plus um, Canadian that's families great. here studying in schools outside of the country, so in the U.S., so hopefully, I'm not sure how many of those have teenagers, but um, I'm sure lots of families will be listening in, so, and once again, they can contact you via um, the email that's on the screen there, jpsmith at simonfraseruniversitysfu.ca. Thanks a lot, James. Thank you.